Welcome back, you here at Goldberg. Today we'll be talking about a very interesting argument, quote unquote, you might hear from followers of liberalism. And by that I mean left liberals and also conservatives, because on this subject there isn't a whole lot of daylight between them. It goes along the lines of, eh, you stole your land, referring to the Indians and what in the current stage is the United States of America, although it's very divided, as we all are aware. Like many similar claims, this is not entirely logical or in keeping with realist principles about world history, history itself, to be honest. So I don't want to make this segment about the U.S. government was right in its Indian policy, because that's not true, but nor will it be, oh, the Indians were these innocent little victims who did nothing wrong. Unfortunately, a lot of liberals tend to look at anyone who's not a lighter skin tone and assume that they were perpetually this group of, you know, new age, peaceful, in sync with nature, very advanced and wise. They didn't have any flaws. I mean, it's funny because the standards that leftists will erect for those of European origin are some that no POC group, if you will, has ever been able to meet themselves, these moral standards, and uh, it, it really is kind of amusing, but sad at the same time. So first on this agenda is a suggestion, somehow, as we're saying, they're this one block, right? They were all, you know, getting along kumbaya. You had thousands of different language groups. You also had countless different tribes. Now, ethnicity, they didn't understand it in all cases like we might today, but they did distinguish themselves on the basis of hairstyle. And they would go to war, and yeah, there's a lot of violence in the pre-European history of the United States that's kind of glossed over because, well, you, we can't go there, that doesn't fit the narrative. Um, you need to appreciate it, though, because just like anything else, it's part of the culture. And we'll get more into that in just a second. Now, if you've watched Yellowstone, you probably remember Monica going, Columbus, the man who introduced genocide to North America. <laughs> nice try, sweetie. You can look at the Iroquois Empire, the Five Nations, the wanton destruction, the number of tribes, and I guess we could call them ethnic groups, completely wiped off the face of the map, being subsumed or turned into slaves or just outright slaughtered. And this isn't some kind of apologist propaganda. If you bother to look at the pre-European history, you'll come to appreciate this. And their conflicts didn't end there. To the very end, they were still infighting, which is one of the reasons why they never had a very uh, strong united front against the U.S. government. Uh, Empire of the Pale Moon, Quanah Parker. Now you could go, oh, he was half white. That's why he was violent. But I think it was the Tonkawa or Tonkala, the ones that were accused of being ca uh, cannibals, who were willing to side with the U.S. government, as many other tribes did, because the Comanche had been so brutal to them. This is not something new. If they were all on the same side as POCs, who they probably would never... In fact, in the early stages when the Europeans landed, way back when, a lot of them were killed off by Indians. But the problem is the Indians never understood we have to be, you know, a collective force. They were still wrapped up in their own little divisive activities, and so that's where you end up. Interesting point here, by the way. Kelly Aspley who is the actress of Monica, is not actually Native American. And indeed, it's rare that you see an Indian woman who's very attractive. I will give you the girl from Smoke Signals. Now, if you look at the book, it's called 20 Years Amongst Our Hostile Indians. It's one of the best as far as uh, documentary, like photographic evidence is concerned. He was an Indian agent, but he also criticized the U.S. government, and he had differing views of tribes. Some he considered to be high quality, others were just like, he was very condescending. But it's interesting, usually the men look like they got great skin, they're proud, they're smiling. The women look like they're living through hell. And that's because most Indian societies required the women to do almost all the physical labor, agriculture, making the food, uh, making like, do, skinning the animals, preferring clothes, gathering wood. So I wonder if that didn't, in some respects, eliminate some of the cuter girls down the line. I'm going to get a, a tax for that. I'm not trying to offend anyone. I'm just saying what I've noticed, that they had to pick a Wasian chick to play a, uh, you know, an Indian girl as opposed to an actual Indian girl. 
which is kind of interesting. Now, it's also worth noting that the actress who played Monica was in that Defiance show. In this case, she played Alak, the son of the weird dude with white hair. Just a bit of trivia. Now, some will go, yeah, but what about the disease? All right, Europeans are at fault for disease that the Indian groups didn't have immunity to. Even though liberals will tell you, believe in evolution, not religion, but when evolution works its magic, no, 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 it was a bioweapon. Even though many scholars will tell you that uh, the grasp of medicine and germ theory in Central South America, and probably to a certain extent in North America as well, was vastly superior to what the Europeans even comprehended. So uh, the Europeans are blamed for a disease that they had more immunity to, that took out a bunch of Indians, and so it's a European genocide, it's a European disease. Now, if you look at the bubonic plague, it has been traced to China. But what happens when you try to blame China for a disease that kills a ton of people? Oh, I don't know, maybe out of today's headlines you guys could tell me. It's completely nonsensical. In fact, Ward Churchill, out of his propaganda machine, had to take the whole smallpox blankets, which is not based on any valid evidence, because they weren't able to actually account for the fact, look, this is just how nature works. It's sad in some respects, but, you know, you think, what, this is something uniquely the Europeans understood? No. Disease, there was a case, I believe, of a, a Christian army that tried to attack Muslims, this is way back, and a plague pretty much eradicated them. It was considered a sign from God. It's not some magical thing that the Europeans just developed. It is the way the world works, in some respects, very tragically. In relation to violence as a societal tool, uh, there's a scholar who makes this you know, comparison. It's kind of amusing, but she goes, you see, in Europe, torture was used as a tool of the state, but amongst the Indians, it was just to maintain public and social order. It's like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah that makes sense. Um, yeah, it was part of the, a lot of the tribal custom. Torture was normal. Slavery was not at all uh, uncommon. In fact, there was a well-established slave trade well before Europeans ever set foot. Now, they were perhaps, they had a looser lines of race, you might say, but they absolutely believed in slavery, and if you didn't accept being a slave, they would kill you. If you were a man, they would make you work with the women to humiliate you, emasculate you. So, yeah, these weren't just nice little hippies who like to sing songs, okay? Um, like any other group throughout history, there's going to be stages of development. They were at a particular level, and that's just how it is. You don't have to be angry about it. You just have to accept fact. But in terms of ownership of land, it's worth noting the Black Hills Indians, where we get those Indian Wars and Custer's Last Stand and sitting bull. It's fascinating because the reason they were in the Black Hills, if you look back far enough, is because other Indian tribes had started expanding westward, and they had gotten kicked out, and they kicked out other tribes. And scholars will accept this. They would go to war, they would fight over resources, they would fight over uh, people, slaves, and they would fight over land. Now, they didn't probably appreciate Lockean liberal property rights because many of them were nomadic, so you're not going to necessarily put up a fence around a spot. But they absolutely understood land in the sense of you own something. Maybe not that one person has it and only he controls it, but they absolutely had a conception of ownership because they fought over land. This brings us to the point of, yeah, but what about the treaties that were violated? If you have any understanding of realism, a treaty is only as good as the ability of both sides to enforce it. Asymmetrical treaties are not very uh, good at being maintained for the simple fact that if I can squash you like a bug, why wouldn't I down the road? And the Indians never comprehended this. They didn't adopt modern technology to where they would have been formidable. They were still split off. They were still having their conflicts. And so... Of course, the developers, the railroad guys, are going to take advantage of the state of affairs. This is something that Indians never comprehended. It's kind of like what you see in Palestine, West Bank today. Some Care Bears come in, they make development, and there's a conflict, fight with the Palestinians. They're like, oh, help, help. And so 
the police or military uh, advances, oh, we have to restore security. This is what uh, you, the rancher might do, expand his fences, or the railroad guy send out the workers to make the line longer, and it bumps into someone's hunting grounds. There's a confrontation, person gets hurt, okay, now the government can come and stomp you out. And the Indians didn't really get this. They thought, oh, yeah, they're just going to respect it. Right, but you have varying interests. You have the government, you have the private interests, and this is inevitably going to become a problem, which is one of the reasons why, regardless of how you want to look at him, Jackson, in many respects, was a bit of a humanitarian. He understood that this conflict was inevitable, so he was trying to basically kick the can down the road by moving them. Like most governmental projects, it was somewhat disastrous. Although, remember, it's a two-sided street. So when the Navajo were beaten and put on a reservation, a lot of them, going back to that whole, we're men, we don't do that type of work. They refused to grow food. They were provided with seeds. They refused to grow food, and many of them just starved to death. So it's not just the government didn't do anything. It was like, no, we don't want to abandon any part of our old culture. Well, the world is leaving your culture behind, unfortunately. Furthermore, it should be noted that some of these treaties were actually instigated by Indians because they would kidnap people and try to basically coerce terms that they wanted. So it's not as simple as it's presented. Uh, but yeah, if you had had, let's say, a Chinese empire in California and a Chinese army there, and they had said, we are going to guarantee the independence of the Indians, then yeah, it would have been much harder for the U.S. to violate that. It's just like the U.S. would have stomped out Fidel Castro except for the fact that the Soviet Union was guaranteeing his independence. So treaties are more complicated than just a piece of paper. It's also about uh, powerful actors, resources, militaries, economies. You have to comprehend this if you want to understand the history of the United States. Ultimately, the greatest mistake made by the Native Americans is that they actually didn't adopt that common identity until it was too late. They didn't start seeing themselves as actually one group. Really, it took until the 1800s, and they had this whole concept where God had started baking bread, and it came out too early. So that was the white man who was uh, clever but physically weak. And then God tried again, and it came out overcooked. And that was the black man who was strong but not intelligent. And then he tried one more time, and it came out red. And that was the red man, the Indian, who was clever but also very physically strong. They started understanding that, but they didn't have the recognition of the times they were living in. I've always thought, if they had started in the 1820s, 30s, 40s, moving out to, let's say, California, Oregon, Washington area, and just making fixed settlements, reproducing in high numbers, and adopting modern technology, particularly becoming experts with weaponry, you know, investing in some cannons, whatever, it would have been much harder to dislodge them. But because they were still a lot of these scattered tribes, still some trying to be nomadic, it was only a matter of time when civilization is going to run up against you and it's going to be that clash. And you're probably going to lose because you can't reproduce fast enough when you have a nomadic people. It's not very effective if you look historically. Um, you need some fixed settlements for population growth. And of course, you're going to be more isolated from the mainstream and there's going to be business interests saying get rid of them. So it's a sad story, but it also teaches you you can't just hold on to your traditions indefinitely without making some modifications because the world is going to leave you rapidly in the dust.